Uh, welcome everyone to our Learning at Lawrence Alumni College Presents session today, Friday, July 17th. My name is Shana Shalou and I plan events for the Alumni Development Office here at Lawrence University. Given that we're unable to offer our typical on-campus in-person events, such as our Bjorklund and seminars, reunion alumni college sessions, and lunch at Lawrence events, we've designed this new virtual engagement series that can continue on even after the pandemic has ended. As Laurentians, uh, we know that you look forward to connecting and engaging with Lawrence in programs like the Bjorklund and seminars. And normally, our speaker today would be giving his reunion convocation address to our alumni in June. Uh, but today, he is giving a talk about the state of the university. Um, so with that, I want to welcome Lawrence University President Mark Burstein. And I want to thank him for his willingness to be a presenter in this new virtual forum. If you have any questions for Mark, please submit them via the chat function, and we will have time for those questions at the end of his presentation. And now for our featured speaker, Mark Burstein. Thanks, Shana. Thanks so much for joining us today. Really, really appreciate it. And I, I feel so much lack not being able to see you all in a room or at least on my Zoom screen, uh, given our uh, format. So I apologize for that. And uh, you know, really excited about having this conversation with all of you today. Uh, this has been probably the busiest summer I have experienced in my 27 years in higher education. Uh, just the pandemic and the need to recalibrate uh, pretty much every aspect of the Lawrence experience for the fall term and for the entire academic year has been a, uh, a consuming passion, I would say, um, in terms of uh, what we need to accomplish. So that meant that uh, when I uh, agreed to this presentation with Shana a number of weeks ago, I had no idea what this week would be. Uh, this was the week that we announced our plans for the fall term, and I just left a webinar with uh, close to 500 parents and students asking questions about that. So uh, thanks to Malcolm Davis, uh, a student uh, member of the president's office. Uh, we have pulled together a presentation very quickly over the past 48 hours or so uh, using material from other presentations. So I apologize that it may not look like it is a uh, formatted presentation all in one, but I'd like to give you a sense of what's happening at Lawrence and uh, really what's happening in the sector more generally, what's happening at Lawrence specifically, and then our aspirations uh, for the institution going forward. And I'm really looking forward to your questions. I'm mindful that I forgot to close my door and there are other colleagues working in Samson House. So if you give me a second, I'm gonna close my door. One second. So first, I'd like to talk a little bit about the sector, what's happening in the sector. And as you would expect, those are, I know all of you are great consumers of information and up to date, the higher education sector is experiencing extraordinary turbulence. I would say it was experiencing extraordinary turbulence before the pandemic, and now we've gone into hyperdrive uh, as a sector in terms of the impact of the pandemic and more broadly, various different larger trends across the United States. I'm gonna talk about three today, um, demographics, uh, the cost, and also um, segmentation and what's happening with segmentation in the sector. And then we'll go specifically about Lawrence today. So first about demographics. Uh, these slides give you a little bit of a sense of what's happening with high school graduates year by year. First, uh, in the uh, upper screen, I hope you can see my uh, mouse here. In this uh, table, you can see what is happening in the larger United States. Uh, we are right here. Um, there is a slight uptick and then a significant ski slope down uh, that is almost a little bit over a 9% decrease in the entire um, US high school graduating classes. That is mirrored in the lower 
screen, the lower uh, table, you can see what's happening both in the Midwest and in the state of Wisconsin. And that decrease is also mirrored. The uptick is not as much. Uh, and that's primarily, uh, as you'll see in later slides, that uptick is primarily uh, students of color, uh, Latinx students, um, students who uh, are of Asian descent and other students, and they are not as present in uh, the state of Wisconsin or in the upper Midwest. And so we don't have as large an uptick in the next couple of years. So first, we have to think about that our pool of applicants to Lawrence is decreasing rapidly. The second is now drilling down a little bit more on what's happening with domestic students and specifically what percentage are domestic students of color. The uh, lines, the dotted lines in the middle of your uh, table show what's happening specifically in the United States. And you can see the yellow line, which is um, US domestic students of color almost get to 50% of the high school graduating class by the year 2025, just slightly under a majority. And of, of course, the corresponding percentage of students that are white are decreasing in a commiserate rate. The lines, the outer lines are what's happening in Lawrence. And you can see also that we have been increasing rapidly uh, in terms of the percentage of domestic students of color, but it, we are still significantly underrepresented uh, in terms of our domestic students of color in our student population. And from a competitive position, this is something that we really need to change as an institution. If we're gonna be viable for the next 20, 30, 50 years, we need percentages closer to the US percentages to ensure that we're open to all the students that are high school students. And this then really underlines our work in terms of creating a equity-minded, more inclusive, anti-racist educational environment. We, we must be able to meet those goals to really play in this marketplace that's very different than our historic marketplace as an institution. This is a slide that talks a little bit about uh, affordability, and there's a lot of information on this slide. I, I would stick to the top for a minute. So first, interestingly, on average, families spent a little more than $26,000 for college uh, last, well now two academic years ago. This study comes back out in the fall, so we'll have new information. And if you see in the bar, chart on the lower left, uh, that number decreased and has been decreasing. So families are paying less and less for college every year. And you can see in the percentages how that is covered if that number is less, that what's going up is the uh, scholarship and grants. So for us, the full speed to full need effort is critical to meet that expectation. Uh, also, uh, borrowing has become a much more significant component of paying for college. And then also uh, families and friends who help support. But in general, this trend that families have less and less money to pay for college is a very powerful one affecting us. I also mentioned segmentation as a uh, aspect of what's happening in the higher education sector. Uh, let me go through how to read this chart first. So along the x-axis is a profile demand index. This is uh, an index that is uh, proprietary to our um, uh, admissions and financial aid consultant human capital. Uh, the goal is to be as, uh, uh, have the, uh, uh, or really move to the right on this slide. Uh, get to the profile demand index that is 90% or better. Um, 
and uh, across the y-axis is net assets per student as measured by your endowment. Um, these are two, um, I would say, interlocking um, uh, 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 data points uh, for us and for many other institutions. There are a series of slides that we had that I, I took out of this specific presentation that specifically mapped uh, endowment per student and ranking on US News and World Report. And there's almost an exact correlation between the endowment per student and US News and World Report. The more money in your endowment per student, the higher your rank. And I think that that makes sense because that resource allows you to provide a certain educational environment that would be considered at a higher ranked institution. Uh, the way the bubbles work are that um, yellow bubbles are private institutions, blue bubbles are public institutions. The size of the bubble is the size of your student body. Uh, we are the red dot uh, underneath our shield in the upper white right quadrant. And one of the things I think is interesting about our placement is that our net assets per student actually in many ways is higher than our profile demand index. And one of the reasons, there may be others, but the, one of the big motivating reasons for that is that we are uh, nouveau riche. Uh, we are, uh, um, our, our endowment has grown very significantly over the past uh, six, seven years. Uh, it actually has grown more than 50%. And that has moved us into a different net asset per student uh, um, a quadrant. We were actually two boxes down on this slide uh, seven years ago. Uh, and you can see that there are many more uh, yellow dots in that area. Uh, but we haven't uh, fully deployed those resources uh, uh, given where we are in terms of um, uh, planning and uh, the way that the endowment supports the operating budget to enrich the academic experience that we provide. But you can see that there is significant segmentation across this group of over 3,500 institutions that teach undergraduates, uh, and that the, uh, the institutions that are represented by circles in the upper right are drifting significantly up uh, from the larger group of institutions. And you know, one of the things that really has struck me is as I think about uh, when I joined uh, Columbia University at the beginning of my career in higher education now, 27 years ago, yes, Columbia was an Ivy League institution, but there wasn't actually much difference in families' minds between Columbia, NYU, and Fordham, all uh, in city schools, in New York City schools. Now there is dramatic difference in terms of the way those institutions can provide supports for students and families. For example, financial aid for study abroad or uh, access to internships in a very more robust way, given the resources that Columbia has compared to those other institutions. And that is happening across the higher education sector. So that is a little bit about what's happening in the larger sector, right? This ideas of uh, obviously overall turbulence, then a demographic decrease, so fewer and fewer students for us to recruit to Lawrence. Cost, costs continue to go up, but families are paying about the same amount they did five years ago, actually. So there has to be other resources that are filling in uh, and also segmentation, that institutions are very different than each other uh, than they were 25 years ago. So let me now go to uh, where Lawrence is today and give you a little bit of a sense. I had a, a chance to see 
uh, who is registered uh, for this webinar today. And I know some of you are very connected to Lawrence and this information will not be new, but others of you are a little bit less connected to Lawrence. So give a little bit of context about who we are today as an institution. So first, 1,500 students, more or less. Some years were a little bit higher, some years were a little bit lower. We have a much larger reach than we used to even 20 years ago. We now have 44 states and 38 countries. Uh, less than a third of our student population comes from our three largest states, feeder states, uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Minnesota. And instead, we have a broad reach across the United States and also around the globe. Still, we're a very vibrant place with many, many student organizations. Uh, we continue to field 21 Division III athletic teams. And actually, we've just gone up to 22 uh, this fall, hopefully, or this winter, where we will be fielding a women's hockey program. We have one of the lowest faculty student ratios in the country. Uh, part of that is the conservatory, but part of that is also this ethos around uh, uh, being able to take tutorials and other one-on-one -on -one learning. Over 90% of our students have one tutorial or one-on-one -on -one learning instruction opportunity at least once in their career. Many of them have multiple options like that. And also now we provide four degree programs, uh, a Bachelor of Arts in our Arts and Sciences uh, departments, uh, a Bachelor of Music in, given by the Conservatory, a Bachelor of Musical Arts, which is a new degree program this year that really is formed around improvisation and jazz and also our double degree program. So a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Music. And students uh, 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 sort of find their way through those programs. A, just a general rule is about 30% uh, of our student body is in some ways taking a degree program connected to the conservatory. 70% is taking a degree program connected to the college. Our largest major is biology, uh, so very similar to many liberal arts colleges across the campus. I'm sorry, across the country. This is a, a, a chart that um, is really a, a point of pride for me, honestly, uh, and it helps understand what the, um, how an institution is serving uh, Pell Grant recipient students. A Pell Grant recipient student would be in the bottom quintile of income in the United States. And the way to read this is along the bottom is again using cap the human capitals criteria for, um, um, uh, what do they call it, for uh, demand, their demand index. And as you can see, as you move up uh, the demand index, uh, uh, the uh, grouping that's a seven, so that would be an Ivy League institution, for example. Uh, my, my old employer, Princeton, is in the seven group. Um, you can see that there are very, very few um, uh, Pell recipients who are gaining access to those institutions. Uh, the way to read this graph is the red line is all the institutions uh, and the uh, uh, the, red hor um, the red vertical line is all institutions in that group. The horizontal line is the, um, the, the average, no, the median institution. Uh, and then the um, uh, turquoise box shows the majority of the institutions that are represented in that group. The next group, uh, number six, in terms of the demand profile, you can see that they serve more institute, more uh, Pell Grant recipients. But what I think is really proud for me is that the orange dot is Lawrence. So that we are uh, really serving many more Pell 
uh, grant recipients than uh, our group of institutions uh, on average do. Uh, and I think that this is a really point of pride that is a historic point of pride for Lawrence. We've always been a place where students from families of limited means uh, have a transformative education that changes the trajectory of their lives. Uh, that has happened for generations. Many of you represent that, and I am so proud of that. Uh, but that continues as an ethos. Another aspect of this chart is you can see a demand profile of one has the most Pell Grant recipients. And again, this is about segmentation. Sadly, uh, the segmented institutions that are less rigorous have the most representation from a socioeconomic perspective, while the ones that are most rigorous have the least representation. And we are really trying our best to break that trend. As I mentioned, this idea of being nouveau riche, uh, this chart helps understand that. Uh, the blue line uh, in this uh, line graph is contributions every year to the endowment. Oh, and I apologize, uh, we left off the access on the left side. Um, the the uh, first line from uh, the, um, uh, the numbers of years is 5 million, then 10 million, 15 million, 20, it goes up 5 million every year to the top line being 30 million. So you can see that um, thanks to the campaign, there's been extraordinary uh, investment in the endowment uh, in the year uh, 2015. We got more than, uh, thanks to an amazing generosity of Lawrence uh, community, uh, we received over $25 million that went into the endowment. That is that blue peak. But you can see in many other years, uh, we have been putting in 10 million or more into the endowment. When uh, before the campaign, uh, that was really unheard of. We were putting in less than 5 million a year. That has huge impact on the institution's resources, uh, not only now, but in perpetuity as that money compounds. Uh, the red line is distributions from the endowment. As the endowment size goes up, that continues to support the um, uh, operating budget in a more and more robust way. And the green line is the total endowment net assets. So you can see in 2013, at the end of 2013, uh, when I had the privilege of uh, joining Lawrence uh, as president, uh, we were barely above 200 million, and we are now north of 350 million. An extraordinary run up in resources as an institution, primarily in scholarship funds, and we'll go into the impact of that on every student. So for those of you who participated in this campaign, thank you so much. You are changing this institution's uh, trajectory and the trajectory of every student that we serve. So uh, this is a slide that goes a little bit more into segmentation and how segmentation works. Uh, this is information from admissions for this fall class. And uh, just to give you a sense of how to read this graph, the middle vertical line is yield, and it is tracking the percentage of yield increase by an institution. So yield would mean um, the number of students that you made an offer to that then decided to accept that offer. So yield, negative, positive. And then the horizontal line is deposits against your original goal. So midpoint is you met your goal exactly. To the right of the line is you exceeded your goal. To the left of the line is you uh, had lower than your goal. Uh, uh, matriculate uh, as a class or 
um, made a promise to come. We haven't had matriculation yet uh, because we haven't started the fall term or fall semester yet. So one quick way of thinking about it is you want to be in the upper right quadrant. Uh, those are institutions that both uh, have improved yield and also exceeded uh, their deposit goal. And you can see that Lawrence is in a rarefied group of institutions that have uh, exceeded both their uh, yield of last year and also the, um, their goal for the entering class. A and on the flip side, you can see that the lower left quadrant, which is institutions that uh, have had their yield go down and also missed their target is a very large group of institutions. So you can start seeing that the, even in this group of colleges, they're all um, um, liberal arts colleges in the Midwest in two different groups, the Associated Colleges of the Midwest and the Great, Lake, Great Lakes College Association. But you can start seeing how these institutions are changing their profile just in this last year in terms of um, the admissions and the strength of the admissions uh, for the fall. So that was a very quick view of what Lawrence is like today. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about what is our strategy for? How do we think about building on these strengths? And there are so many strengths for Lawrence right now, but how do we build on those strengths? Really position the institution for the next 20, 30, 50 years. And I'm gonna talk very briefly about uh, strategies on the curricular or academic side of the institution, then the co-curricular side of the institution, and then end with affordability and then get to your questions. So on the academic side of the institution, what we are trying to do is build on the historic strengths of us as a college, which have primarily been in departments, academic departments, and use that strength to uh, reinforce, reimagine, uh, uh, create new interdisciplinary areas. Uh, the way that institutions, colleges and universities are structured across departmental uh, 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 departmental units is something that grew out of Germany in the 1800s as the modern university form. This idea that people who taught a, the same discipline would be organized together. So if I was a historian, I joined the history department. If I was teaching a language, I would join that individual department, Spanish or German or French, et cetera. Um, if I was teaching biology, I would join the biology department. You can see the pattern here. But much of the learning today is in the interstitial spaces between departments. Uh, the first example on this list, cognitive neuroscience, this idea of how to understand how the brain works, includes colleagues on our campus from biology, from psychology, from physics, from chemistry, from math, from linguistics, from philosophy, from education. All these colleagues are cognitive scientists or neuroscientists really thinking about how the brain functions. How does it work? And so taking those strengths and then building a program really allows us to enrich the curricular offerings that we can provide students. Data science is the exact same thing. Um, obviously, uh, the math and computer science department uh, is the center of data science, 
but there are also colleagues in economics, uh, in uh, biology, uh, in psychology, um, some of the humanities uh, departments who are using chemistry, are using large data sets uh, as their um, uh, research area, or for that matter, their lab is a large data set that they are trying to evaluate. Uh, we just announced a data science minor. Um, we have both a cognitive science and neuroscience major. Uh, the neuroscience major was just approved recently, and those colleagues are now coming together to create a combined major uh, in that area. Um, we also, in all these other areas, have majors, uh, environmental studies, ethnic studies, film studies, another area that includes uh, music and linguistics and colleagues in history and various different language programs, as well as faculty that are specifically in the film studies uh, interdisciplinary program. Global studies is another major, and also our innovation and entrepreneurship program. The one area that I apologize is left off this list is our Bachelor of Musical Arts. Again, a program that is combining strengths from various different departments in the conservatory into a new degree program. So part of the strategy is using strengths and building from them into new interdisciplinary areas. On the co-curricular front, uh, one of our uh, resources as we think about uh, strategies going forward is what's called our admitted student survey. A survey that we send out to all students who we admitted, whether they accepted our offer of admissions or not. And, you know, thankfully, students and their families are very um, uh, forthcoming in their feedback on various different things. This is data from one of those uh, uh, areas, and it's how they ranked uh, various different aspects of a Lawrence experience. Excuse me, the red dots are information on how students who decided not to accept our offer ranked us. The blue dots are from students who did accept our offer. The way to read this is that um, uh, things that are below the middle line are ones where those groups of students said that they were less critical aspects of the Lawrence experience uh, as they ranked Lawrence's capability in that area, things above the middle line were more important. And again, you would want to focus on the upper quadrant. The upper left is opportunities for us. And you can see some interesting dynamics here, which is students who accepted our offer of admissions uh, rank our campus life positively, but less importantly. Students who rejected our offer uh, are not as positive about um, the uh, student, the campus life experience that we provide. Location is even more interesting, I, I think, which is uh, for those who accepted our offer, uh, location was not an, as important in a, uh, a criteria, but it was still ranked positively. Uh, for students who rejected our offer, location was uh, uh, very negatively seen and more important for those students. Uh, academic reputation also has a difference there. Uh, and financial aid affordability has a difference. So thinking about, um, I talked a little bit about our strategies on the academic side, but what we really need to do is think about opportunities in campus life and also ways of describing our location differently that shows the aspects of that location that really provide an excellent uh, uh, undergraduate liberal arts education. On the other hand, there's some really good news. Um, career preparation, um, both seen positively uh, for students who 
uh, did not accept our offer. Um, they ranked it slightly less important and slightly less highly, but not, not really uh, almost statistically different. Uh, the difference is not statistically uh, uh, valid here, uh, but they're both in actually a decent place. Um, I was also surprised, uh, surprised that experiential learning opportunities was relatively positive. Uh, graduate school uh, preparation, again, relatively positive. Again, I apologize for the, uh, um, oh, actually, it's not misspelled school. It's just that the line is cutting out the, uh, 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 the O and making it look like a C. So you can see that there's work to do and we have initiatives uh, in this area and campus life and location. I think um, back to one of the real successes here uh, is this extraordinary impact of full speed to full need. Uh, and you saw that earlier in a slide about the growth of our endowment. Here's a way of looking at it that is an impact on our students uh, and the experience that we provide. The upper line is our stated comprehensive fee. So you can see that it's growing every year, as you would expect, given our increase in costs. But what's beautiful about this graph is that our average debt at graduation has been decreasing year by year. Uh, and in fact, is at an all time low over actually a 10 year period. We only capture a certain part of that. So it shows the power of having uh, need-based uh, uh, scholarship available to each student that allows the endowment to stand in for that family uh, to cover the costs and ensures that that family is borrowing less every year uh, to pay for a uh, Lawrence education. And again, this is average debt at graduation, not the yearly debt, but the average debt at graduation. If we were a full need institution, that would be about $25,000. So we still have a way to go in terms of supporting students and families in the way that federal methodology says we should uh, to ensure that they can afford a college education. But I think as members of the Lawrence community, we should be so proud of this progress as an institution. What makes all of this possible, uh, all of this new initiatives, this trying to reposition Lawrence for the future is the campaign. And again, I want to uh, thank every person uh, in this webinar who has provided uh, support for this campaign in the place that they feel uh, really speaks to them and in the way that they feel they're capable of. We have now almost reached $215 million of raised funds towards our goal of 220. Uh, the campaign ends uh, at, uh, at the end of this calendar year, December 2020. So 220 million in 2020. And you can see also the incredible investment in scholarship funds, 82.2 million. In the campaign, we actually had a $5 million gift outside of the campaign. So we really raised $87.2 million for, for full speed to full need, which is an amazing testament to the Lawrence community and our values and what we care about. We care about supporting every student and family uh, so they can succeed and thrive at Lawrence. So with that, thank you so much for uh, uh, sticking with me. I, I'm sorry that this couldn't be more interactive, which is my preference in presentations. And let's go to questions. Shana. Great. Um, we're going to start with a question that was emailed to us from Nathan Heppel, who's class of 2002, who's on our LUAA board of directors. If there is an outbreak of COVID-19 on campus, what are the plans for ensuring student, staff, teacher health and safety? as well as the community in general safety outside of LU? 